Perry from Reset Brain and Body here to talk to you about scary thoughts. So some of you might be really familiar with these. Uh, some of you might be a little bit more in the dark about what it means to have these scary thoughts. So a couple examples. When something is really hanging on your mind and is feeling like a negative spiral of like, what if this happens? What if this happens? What will I do if this happens? And just kind of spiraling around that negativity, cynical type of thinking. Those can be some scary thoughts. These also can be thoughts that intrusively enter into our sphere where we're all of a sudden just kind of going about our day and then all of a sudden, boom, what if my kid gets cancer tomorrow? Or um, what if my husband gets in a car accident? Or what if my mom falls down the stairs? Uh, those are those intrusive, scary thoughts. Um, catastrophic thinking is another way of looking at some of these thoughts as just immediately going to the worst case scenario, immediately going to the worst outcome. Um, oh, I hit a red light. I'm going to hit the red light and then my, I'm going to be late to my meeting. And then when I'm late to my meeting, then I'm going to get a bad review. And then at that review, they'll tell me I'm fired and then I'll get home and the dinner will burn and my husband will leave me and everything will be horrible. <laughs> so it's these thoughts that send us down a real quick spiral of uh, worst case situations. These thoughts can also be scary thoughts of thinking about ourselves or something that we're gonna do or not do. And so for an example, a lot of you, uh, perhaps in the postpartum experience, maybe had a thought of, oh, what would happen if I just like left my baby here? Or gosh, what if I just didn't change their diaper for three hours because I needed to take a nap? Or, you know, things like negligence that can come up as a scary thought that makes us stop and say like, whoa, what is going on? Or maybe even some of those thoughts of, would anyone even care if I was still here? What's the purpose of any of this? What does my life even matter? So I want to first normalize a lot of these thoughts and that they can be really intimidating when we're not used to them or it feels really shameful. That's the thing when we talk about mental health. And in this case, we're talking about some of that anxiety that can come up to create these thoughts and also depression that can work to create some of these more negative and scary thoughts. But there's so little emphasis or a discussion on this because it does feel so personal and so intimate to have these thoughts. Just the other day, I was having a conversation with my sister and we were both sharing how when we were growing up and we would get home and if no one was at the house, we'd immediately think of the worst case scenario. For me, it was that my whole family was dead in the closets of the house. And it was just such a knee jerk reaction. As soon as I'd get home and the house was empty, I'm like, yep, everyone's dead in the closet. My sister would immediately go to, there's been a horrible car accident, no one told me, and I'm the only survivor. And we had this conversation 30 some years later, and both were like, whoa, you had those thoughts too? And it felt really good to be able to share that experience with her and recognize like, wow, okay, we both knew that independently we've been struggling with anxiety, but now look at like, I wish I wasn't so alone back then. I wish I knew that maybe someone else in my family or one of my friends were also having these scary thoughts. Same goes for a lot of times in the postpartum experience that we can feel really, really, really shameful when we have these scary thoughts about how we look at our kid or how we view our baby, how we view ourselves, and we have to normalize the experience. So first of all, you are not alone if you have these scary, intrusive, catastrophic thoughts. Also, relating to kind of what's going on culturally, I have talked to more and more people than last week that have been doomsday scrolling. I myself had to Google apocalyptic anxiety because I didn't know what it was that I was experiencing. But all of a sudden, I kind of entered into this spiral of, oh my gosh, do I need to get a bunker? What, do I need to go invest in real estate somewhere? Like the world is going to come to an end. Why did I even have children? I entered them into this world that's just going to implode. And I was, as a therapist, able to step back and see what was happening and ask for help immediately. But it's really, really easy to get sucked down this tunnel and then get tunnel vision that like, oh my gosh, everything's horrible. The world is going to end. 
everyone's going to get sick and die. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Even if something is good, the bottom's going to fall out at any moment. And this type of pervasive anxiety is what then can create a mood. And that's the thing with our thoughts is that they come and they go. But a lot of times we don't allow them to leave. We latch on to them. And the more that we attach ourselves to these thoughts, the more that they turn into a mood, right? So if you experience a lot of negative, sad, depressing type of thoughts, we latch on to it. Wow, no wonder we're now depressed, or if we're feeling a lot of scary, out of control, uncertain type of intrusive thoughts, will we latch on to him? Wow, no wonder we're anxious. So I want to explain some of this so that if you have experienced this or are experiencing this right now, you can say, okay, yeah, wow, <laughs> I'm in that camp. And I'm also not so alone. Even as a therapist, this happens to me. Okay. So what do we do? <laughs> so the first thing is to see this at it as it is. I have a client who's a doctor, very high intensity, stressful job. She gets so anxious every single day she's going into work, thinking about like all of the things that could go wrong and all of the experiences that she's had that have led her to this point. And what if she fails and what if it just, it goes on and on and on. So what we decided to do is say, okay, Talk to your anxiety, talk to it, transform it, create a relationship with your anxiety where you can validate it and say, you know what? Yeah, like I'm a doctor. This is a really stressful, high stakes job, but I chose this and I thank you anxiety for showing up as healthy stress to make me realize that I need to be on my game, but that's where I'm going to leave you. Thank you. I get it. I'm here. <laughs> I want to put my game face on. But now that's enough. I don't need you then to take me into the spiral of all the things that could go wrong. I get it. I've read the books, right? So she's having this kind of loving relationship with her anxiety. And we can do this with a lot of our thoughts. So for example, my apocalyptic anxiety that I had around the new year, I had to sit with it and nurture it and develop some compassion with it. But I had to first know what it was, right? Label it. So the more that you know about anxiety, the more you know about depression, the more you know about just our cognitions in general and how they come from all over the place. And they usually are fear-based and not rooted in reality. Then we're able to step back and observe and get curious. So if, for example, you have one of these intrusive thoughts that says all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if my kid gets bullied and pushed over at school and knocks all their teeth out? I don't know. I've had this thought before. I know it feels very random, but if you have that too, you're not alone, right? So what if this happens? Okay. So I will sit there and be like, I don't know. I would figure it out. It'd be fine. We would be fine. We would be okay. But this thought, this, whatever this is, whew, that's intrusive. That's just my anxiety. That's just fear. And I'm able to look at it, get curious and say, okay, what is, what else is this telling me? Am I worried about my kid going to preschool? Am I worried about not having control? Am I feeling vulnerable? And in vulnerability, it's taking my love for my son and expanding it into this fearful thing that now is making me so uncomfortable. Stepping back and get curious. This isn't always easy because I know for a lot of you, these thoughts feel nonstop. They feel like you have no space between them and that it's just a constant cascade of the scary, negative, cynical, catastrophic, ruminating type of thoughts. And so if that's the case for you, if there's not even space to step back, get curious and examine, then I'm going to ask you to find other opportunities in your life to step back and slow down, to take a pause to take a breath between activities. Because when our brain is like this all the time and our body is like this all the time, constantly on the go, a lot of you probably experience the cascade of thoughts as soon as you go to lay down and put your head on the pillow. Well, it's finally the space you've given your body and your brain to rest 
And in that vacuum is all the thoughts that you've just shoved away and avoided and just powered through all day. And they all come up and they just land right there on you. And then what? You can't sleep. <laughs> You're discouraged because you can't sleep. And so that creates more inability to sleep. So if we create opportunities throughout the day to pause, to check in, to notice, to observe, to get curious, we're creating some defenses so that we don't have that avalanche of thoughts as we hit the pillow, but then also in those moments when it's not ideal to have a catastrophic thought or to have an intrusive thought, we've already kind of built up space throughout the day to manage them. So, for example, for me, I know that I need to create enough breaks throughout my day to kind of zoom out, check in, what do I need, what do I want, what's going on, and it's not necessarily because there's a thought coming at me in that moment, but it's more so I'm just trying to regulate. I'm just trying to get some of that stress and adrenaline through my system so that then I can feel more focused and in control for whatever it is I'm going to next. I also make sure that I take time for me in some capacity. And yes, that means I wake up at 525 in the morning. But taking an opportunity to create some space for yourself before the day gets going so that you can just kind of clear out your mind or at least have some spaciousness created so that you have capacity to handle the things that come up that day. I talk about this a lot, and I probably already mentioned it once in these videos, but if you think of yourself as a glass of water, when you wake up in the morning, your water level is going to be at a certain point, depending on how much stuff <laughs> you have going on, how much stuff you've buried or avoided and not released. And so let's say you wake up in the morning and your water's all the way to right here. Well, you only have this much space to handle anything else that comes up that day, including these intrusive, scary thoughts. So if these thoughts only have this much space and they're bombarding you, well, there's no place for them to go other than out. So you explode, you get irritable, or maybe you just shut down completely, you numb out. Either way, you have tapped yourself out. Versus if you wake up in the morning, your water levels may be up here, you say, okay, I'm gonna reset it somehow. I'm gonna lower that water level. Maybe it means that I just need to sit in quiet, drink tea, look out the window for five minutes. Maybe I need to journal, maybe I need to exercise. Maybe I need to call a friend, get on Marco Polo. Maybe it is scrolling for you and looking at videos or laughing at TikTok, but whatever it is, lowering that water so you have the capacity to handle the things that come up that day. And then as they come up, we create a loving relationship with it. We develop compassion. Where is this coming from? Why is this coming up? Can I get curious? But sometimes not even then <laughs> is going to be the most productive thing for you because maybe you don't have time in that moment to get curious. And that's where we just need to have that awareness of, oh, that's anxiety. Oh, that's an intrusive thought. Almost like a fly swatter you have in your hand. <laughs> At some point, you can't keep up those defenses for too long. It's like whack-a-mole are always going to come up. And that's why you need to have these practices to create the spaciousness. But if in the moment, it's simply being aware and saying, whoop, Boop, boop, boop. I know what that is, and I'm not going to let it intrude. I'm not going to let it, you know, mess with my vibe right now. So those are some practices that you can do as you manage these scary or intrusive thoughts. I want you to please comment with your own experiences. We have to validate our each other's experiences with st this stuff. Generalized anxiety, anxious thoughts, scary thoughts, intrusive thoughts. It's really, really common. It's super normal, but it doesn't mean that you have to suffer through it. There are ways to work through and get help and manage that relationship with our anxiety in a really healthy way, or it could be our depression in a way that just brings us totally down and again, creates that mood. So please comment, please share your experiences. I would love to hear it. I, would, I know that your peers would love to hear from you too. Um, and of course, reach out to Reset or any other therapist at any point when you are ready to conquer and transform these thoughts into something that can empower you instead of derail you. Thanks so much. See you next week.